across the back. Somehow he telegraphed his motion before he thrust and they saw it and flashed away. I want to ask you to think about something you learned in science, not reflection, but something else that's happening to the spear as it's entering the water. What word is that? The fish are almost being warned that Brian is putting something in the water because water does something. Think of the pencil experiment that we did. If you said refraction, you're right. He needed something to spring the spear forward to make a way for it to move faster than the fish. A string that snapped or a bow, a bow and arrow, a thin long arrow with a point in the water and a bow pulled back so that all he had to do was release. That was it. He had to invent a bow and arrow. He almost laughed as he moved out of the water and put his shoes on. The morning sun was getting hot and he took his shirt off. Maybe that was how it really happened way back when. Some primitive man tried to spearfish and it, it didn't work and he invented the bow and arrow. Maybe it was always that way. Discoveries happen because they need to happen. He had not eaten and eaten anything this morning, so he took a moment to dig up the eggs and eat one. He reburied them, banked the fire with a couple thicker pieces of wood, settled the hatchet on his belt, and took a spear in his right hand and set up off the lake to find more wood to make a bow. He went without a shirt, but something about the wood smoke smell on him kept the insects from bothering him as he walked to the berry patch. The raspberries were starting to become overripe just in two days, and he would have to pick as many as possible after that after he found the wood. But he did take a little time now to pick a few and eat them. They were full of sweet when he picked one. Two others would fall off the limbs into the grass and soon his hands and cheeks were covered with red berry juice and he was full. That surprised him actually being full. He hadn't thought he would ever be full again, knew only the hunger and here he was full. One turtle egg and a few handfuls of berries and he felt full. He looked down at his stomach and saw that it was caved in. It did not bulge out as it would have after two hamburgers and a freezy slush. It must have shrunk and there was still hunger there, but it was not like it was before, not tearing him apart. This was hunger that he knew would always be there, always, even when he had food. A hunger that made him look for things, see things. A hunger that made him hunt. He swung his eyes across the berries to make sure the bear wasn't there at his back. Then, before he moved down the lake, the spear went out. Then he moved down the lake. The the spear went out before him automatically, moving the brush away from his face as he walked, and when he came to the water's edge, he swung left, not sure what he was looking for, not knowing what wood might be best for a bow. But he had never made a bow, never shot a bow in his life, but it seemed that it would be along the lake near the water. He saw some young birch, and they were springy, but they lacked a snap somehow, as did the willows, not enough to whip back. Halfway up the lake, he just just as he started to step over a log, he was absolutely terrified by an explosion under his feet. Something like a feathered bomb blew up and away in a flurry of leaves and thunder. It frightened him so badly that he fell back down and then it was gone, leaving only an image in his mind. A bird, it had been, about the size of a very small chicken with only a fan tail and stubby wings that slammed against his body and made a loud noise. Noises there and gone. He got up and brushed himself off. The bird had been speckled brown and gray, and it must not be very smart because Brian's foot had been nearly on it before it flew. Half a second more and he would have stepped on it and caught it, he thought, and eaten it. He might be able to catch one or spear one or bow one. Maybe, he thought, maybe it tasted like chicken. Maybe he could catch one with his spear and it would probably just taste like chicken, just like chicken when his mother baked it in the oven with garlic and salt and it turned golden brown and crackled. He shook his head to drive the picture out. He moved down the shore. There was a tree there with long branches and it seemed straight when he pulled it on one of the branches and let it go, it snapped. He picked up one of the limbs that seemed just right. The wood was hard and he didn't want to cause it to split so he took his time. He heard a per persistent whine, like the insects, only more steady with an edge of a roar to it. It was in his ears and he chopped and cut and was thinking of a bow and how he could make a bow and how it would be when he shaped it with the hatchet and still the sound did not cut through until the limb was nearly off of the tree and the whine was in his head and he knew then that it was a plane. A plane? 
It was a motor far off, but it seemed to get louder. They were coming for him. He threw down the limb and his spear and holding the hatchet, he started to run for camp. He had to get to the fire on the bluff and signal them, get fire and smoke up. He put all his life into his legs. He jumped over longs, moved through the bush like a light ghost, swiveling, running, his lungs filling and blowing. And now the sound was louder and louder and louder and coming in his direction. If not right at him, at least closer. He could see it in his mind now, the picture, the way it would be. He would get the fire going and the plane he would get the fire going and the plane would see the smoke and circle once and circle twice then again and waggle its wings it would be a float plane and it would land on the water and come across the lake and the pilot would be amazed that he was alive after all these days all this he saw as he ran for the camp and the fire they would take him from here and this night this very night he would sit with his father and eat and tell him all of the things he could see it now oh yes all as he ran in the sun, his legs liquid springs. He got to the camp, still hearing the whine of the engine, and one stick of wood still had a good flame. He dove inside, grabbed the wood, and ran around the edge of the ridge, scrambling up like a cat in blue, and nearly had the flame feeding and growing when the sound moved away. It was abrupt, as if the plane had turned. He shielded from the sun from his eyes and tried to see it, tried to make the plane become real in his eyes. But the trees were so high, so thick, and now the sound was still fainter. He kneeled again to the flames and blew and added grass and chips, and the flames fed and grew, and in a moment, he had a bonfire as high as his head, but the sound was now completely gone. Looking back, he thought, looking back, look back and see the smoke now and turn, please turn. Look back, he whispered, feeling all the pictures fade, seeing his father's face fade like the sound, like lost dreams, like an end to hope. Oh, turn now and come back. Look for me, please. But it kept moving away in him until he could no longer hear it, even in his imagination and in his soul. Gone. He stood at the bluff over the lake, his face cooking in the roaring bonfire, watching the clouds of ash and smoke going into the sky, and thought no more, no more of this. They would not return. Gone, he thought. Gone for him now. He could not play games without the hope. He could not play a game without a dream. They had taken it all away from him now. They had turned away from him and there was nothing for him now. The plane was gone, his family was gone, all of it was gone. They would not come, he was alone and there was nothing for him. And I'm gonna stop there, that was chapter 12.